Thanks for having me, Steve. Uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to see each other once again and to, to discuss these, these issues. I think that they're super important. This is a tough era to be in education. Everybody knows we face you know, the challenges of school closings and reopenings and some aspect of hybrid modeling. Uh, uh, most people feel that we did our best, but that our best was not the best by any means. Um, you know, but what, what I think gets lost in the spaces between are, are the discrepancies, right? Um, you know, if you take an affluent uh, suburban school uh, with a $200 million budget, and compare that to the performance of, uh, you know, a rural school with 57% high poverty or, uh, or an urban school uh, with 68, 78, 88% high poverty. The discrepancies that they had between those two categories, the, those who have the access and the equity and those that didn't have the access or the equity, um, then you'll see a real discrepancy in, 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 in in how schools are, are identified, but also how students were struggling. About, about 89% of schools um, met their logistical needs of remote learning resulting from the pandemic in April 2020. But there's evidence that even though the access was provided by schools, technology was put out and these sorts of things, only about 39% of students actually attended uh, the, these, these live remote sessions. Uh, and when we look at that further, we look at the discrepancy between economically disadvantaged and marginalized uh, populations. And they were enormous uh, with about 50% of low income students having access to learning. Um, and the reason for that is, uh, you know, in, in high urban schools, the population is so great, you couldn't attain Chromebooks or laptops for enough students. And in rural settings, uh, the Wi-Fi, the high-speed internet is such a problem that, that they couldn't log in a, a lot of times. Um, some of this is, is referenced in, the, in, in some Brookings Institute findings. I, I think we're going to post those, uh, those links later. But at the end of the day, man, we have become a tale of two cities more, more than ever before. I, I was going to say, I mean, it sounds like the, you know, the technical capacities, you know, the access to technology, which was already a problem you know, the digital divide. This is yeah. 20 years in the making. Yeah. It, it's now just been exacerbated by a, by a pandemic with, with an unprepared system, unprepared teachers who didn't have the capacity. It, it threw everybody for a loop. And now it's really, you know, again, exacerbated the problem, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, oh, it absolutely does. And, and like, if you look at like the OEC or, or uh, the OESD, the, the, the PISA tests, the national tests, you know, which ranks countries. Yep, yep. Uh, that, that, we're just talking about the digital divide here in America and the impact. Right. Uh, globally, you know, and we're a globalized economic system. Look at what's going on right now economically with the price of anything. Yeah. Uh, globally, the discrepancies are even farther apart. I mean, we have, you know, we have a situation that may evolve into a, uh, into a, you know, a global crisis of economics that we, we thought we had beaten 100 years ago. Right. Well, I mean, the obvious question is, what does this mean, you know, for schools? Like every school is in a different situation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you can't stop what you're doing and try to reevaluate. You've got to kind of fix things on the run yeah. in a way. You know, so how do schools respond to the needs of learners and most importantly, what does this mean for schools that have already been identified as failing schools? This is, this is pre-pandemic. There were schools in trouble and there was a system that identified what they were, how to get remediation. The pandemic comes in. Talk, talk to me about how those forces sure. are changing. So the Brookings Institute led a, uh, uh, I referred to this a little bit ago, but they led a study um, um, a meta-analysis of iReady data on math and reading. And what they found was that, you know, in 2000, in September of 21, so just the beginning of this school year, that kids were six months behind previous analyses from previous years in math and five months behind in reading. 
So that is all students. You know, you're talking about maybe 100,000 students wow. nationally, maybe more. Uh, and the data shows that we are a half a year behind uh, on, on what. So that's our target, right? We got to catch up to that half a year. And, 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 and how we do that is going to be challenging. Um, Would you say that's because of the pandemic, Fred? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's been identified. That half year, at the very least, is missing. Yeah, I mean, let's let's take a, an example of a, a regular elementary school trimester, right? You got a kindergartner, first, second, third grader, all learning to read. They're trying to learn the phonics. They're trying to get phonemic awareness. Well, we cut out the third trimester in March 2020. They missed a third of the year. And then when we brought them back, the majority of schools came back every other day or, you know, four days a week instead of five while there was still uncertainty about how this, this virus would spread. So we then truncated their learning by another, you know, somewhere between three and six months there too. Uh, you count in elements of learning loss over the summer and, you know, you're really talking about a trifecta. That went on for two summers. So you're talking about missing essentially in a, you know, a half a year of school for these kids, whether it was all in one trimester or truncated by missing days in the week. Um, so that learning loss is that's that's real. The, the great the Council of Great City Schools has a white paper um, on it's called unfinished learning. It's got a longer title than that. But if you Google Great Council of City Schools uh, and then if you Google the unfinished learning, that white paper is really worth a read. Uh, it's about 40 pages long, but it has some excellent research in there about unfinished learning because it's not really learning loss. Learning loss means you learned it. And then you dropped it. Unfinished learning means you couldn't get to the point where you learned it. Interesting. It you know, we weren't in school for you to learn it. Right. You know, right. That, there's a difference. There, there's a clear difference there that I don't think people uh, appreciate yeah. as much. And, you know, and now I'm thinking of the, you know, the, the socioeconomic issues that we referred to earlier with the technology, you know, when it comes to, uh the learning problems i'm guessing again it's going to be you you gave that was an average right 0. 0.5 yeah, was an right. average and i'm guessing that if we're looking at at a continuum that the 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 schools the urban schools some of the rural schools who are already struggling with the technology components yeah. are going to have much higher loss yeah, when you, I mean, just look at look at the literacy research before the pandemic, and what we know is that the exposure to language for kids coming into kindergarten makes the largest single point of difference for learning to read. The more words a kid has from talking to parents and having experiences as they enter into kindergarten, the faster that student will learn to read. So take that known research and then couple it with the fact that you know the place where some of those kids get their first exposure to growing vocabulary has been truncated by five or six months. Right, right. And I said learning loss, Fred, correct me. Correct. Yeah, yeah, it's not learning loss. The, the, the real difference between learning loss is we see, uh, there was a good study done with this Maryland schools, I forgot to call it, I wish I had this in my notes. Um, it's in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outlook, uh, uh, Outliers. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really, that's an interesting read too. But, but it talks about this Baltimore City School District research and the summer learning loss. And kids above $65,000 a year family income would go away on, in the summer and have experiences that would teach them more prior knowledge, more vocabulary, more prior knowledge, more experience, more referential material for them to catalog. Kids in high poverty, below $35,000 would actually lose, lose learning in the process of summer. While some kids were getting a year and a half worth of learning from September to August, other kids were getting nine months because they would lose progress from stagnant experiences caused in large part by poverty. Poverty is not a blame thing. If you, when I was young, I, I, my first child was born into poverty. I worked three jobs. I'm not there to teach and speak and work with him all the time. I'm trying to put food on the table. 
yeah. you know? So high property is not a blame. It's the fact that like their exposure is limited, oftentimes overdeveloped television or exposure to, you know, more challenging conversations, um, those sorts of things. They leave children behind right. naturally. And we know this from the reading research. Take this and couple it with what we know from, from, uh, from unfinished learning because the difference is learning loss now unfinished learning. Unfinished, sorry. That was yeah. the phrase, Fred. Yeah. I'm burning that in. Unfinished yeah. learning. And, you know, this thing about experiences and referential material that you can then, you know, build into concepts and, and learn, it, it's not as if, here's the way I think about it. Whether you're in poverty or not, you're having experiences. Mm -hmm. That's not really the issue. The issue is what type of experiences are you having and how do they push you forward in an academic context, you know, and in the skill learning yeah. of school, as opposed to, for instance, you know, I'm West Side of Chicago teacher. They have plenty of experiences and they learn all the time. It's about being vigilant. You know, it, it's about, you know, having to deal with a lot of forces, you know, in their neighborhoods or at home that aren't necessarily positive forces. So they are building capacity, but it's not the capacity that that's, that we, you know, we need to get them to, right? So that they they have those skills coming out of school. Yeah. So uh, what what can be done, Fred? I mean, what, what do we, what can we do to best prepare students for recovery, given the fact there are so many different students in different situations, but we also have these institutions and, and these state and federal guidelines that are making assessments constantly and putting pressure on schools and classrooms to deliver and, and to, to measure success. So, so what, how do we, how do we take all these things and <clears throat> develop a coherent approach. That, that's a real good coupling there, Steve, because you're really talking about the convergence of, of two bad situations. Um, you, you know, having been, you know, uh, I, I ran a high school, uh, you referenced it earlier, I ran a high school, um, it, it was an inner city school, uh, we had 67% poverty, um, you know, and it was, it was an urban environment. Um, the kids were great, the teachers were great, you, you know, the system was not. And what they did was, was we got caught in a situation Previous principals, previous systems, I, I can't accuse the principals of doing it. I don't know what they knew and didn't know. But when I took over, I found that there was some discrepancies in the transcripts. That became a, an enormous problem. Uh, you know, national news um, where we were, we were, the school system was putting credits on kids' transcripts for classes they never took. Um, like I said, it was a tough scandal to sort of, try and navigate through um, and it, you know, it was challenging, but it had to be done because what we were doing was we were sending kids to college unprepared for college and they were accruing debt. They were already in high poverty. So they would go, they would leave the city, come back to the city a semester later having failed out or having found it too stressful or too challenging because we weren't, they, they, we didn't prepare them well enough. We just gave them free stuff. And Fred, can, it, can I interject? Yeah, Are you bringing that in, I'm guessing? Yeah. Because the pressure that that school was under to graduate, yeah, their graduate that was, yeah. since that was the main metric, it, yep. it put the, the professionals in a situation where they had to either figure out a way to get everybody graduated or, you know, be, be jeopardized, right. you know, their, now, their own. I, I wasn't there when that was going on. So I can't, I can't say what they were thinking. But yes, you're accurate in your assessment that, that a school has a vested interest in seeing their metrics grow to avoid accountability that may put them in a position of compromising their ethical standing. Um, and again, I, I was part of the solution, not part of the problem. So I don't know why the problem occurred, but I, I, know, that, I know that that was certainly a theory. Uh, that that was kicked around. Now, right, and 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 this was obviously present pre-pandemic. These types of pressure. Oh, this is not pandemic. new. This is this is ten years before a pandemic. Uh, you know, and it had been going on for a decade before that. So this is not new. This is directly related to accountability. Right. Um, I bring back the concept of what the great city schools 
the Council of Great City Schools was saying. What we can't do is create an artifice of learning for these kids. Just because it's, so let's say you have a second grade. You don't give them the first grade curriculum. That's a problem. Don't do that. Don't reverse your course because they'll never become 12th grade. Theoretically, gotcha. Right. So you have to give them the current curriculum. But what you have to do is you really have to analyze it. And, and the work we've been doing in upstate New York, it's about priority standards. What are, the te- what are the questions? What are the standards that are most tested on state assessments? That becomes your priority because you don't want to be in accountability. And I'll get to that in a minute. Second one is, what are the best strategies that you can use in a classroom so that you can affect, you can, if you know it works better than other strategies, you affect better change. So we look at John Hattie's research. He's a, a researcher out of Australia. Um, and he's got a barometer of influence that has, I mean, thousands of ideas in it, but it's a really, really good, uh, good site. I, again, that link will be uh, provided for everybody. Um, so you got your priority standards. You got your, uh, your John Hattie best strategies. And then you look at the social emotional component of things and how you can support kids. The problem comes into place when we all know that that's probably the most important component right now. Accountability does not speak to that. Accountability speaks to the first two. How do I get my test scores up? How do I keep my graduation rates high? How do I get my attendance well? Maybe attendance blends into social emotional, but it's not a metric to measure health. It's a measure. It's a metric to measure attendance and nothing more. So if you're a school that's in, in, in identification prior to the pandemic, what you've learned is that that identification is being carried over. There's no way to get out of it. You cannot make enough growth. There's no tests. So therefore, there's not enough opportunity. Right. Right. If you're getting identified at this point, statistically, I can tell you, you're a high poverty rural or a high poverty urban. Mm -hmm. You had the biggest interruption in education because of a lack of equity and access. And if that's what we're doing in education today, we need to reflect on the purpose of it. The danger here comes that we are about to create a system by back into a system where we are not thinking about children. We're thinking about accountability. I'm an accountability thinker. But I'm also realistic. If, if you're bleeding, stop the bleeding and then address the issue. Or remove the harm right away. Right. Contain the situation. I'm a soccer player too. Contain, control the ball, and then look to score. Right now, it feels like the, that we're about to go into scoring mode without ever having controlled this ball or without stopping that bleeding. I like sports analogies. I'm just <laughs> a fan. I really like it. Stop the bleed. Yeah, that's really, you know, so what do we do almost while we're functioning? How do we, how do we improve this situation? I mean, you've, you mentioned in one of our conversations, you mentioned to me, you said 0.82, Fred. And yeah. I remember, you know, it was the first time I heard it. I know that that's a Hattie um, yeah. kind of, a, we attribute that to Hattie. Can you explain a little bit about what that is and how that can kind of fit into some things that we could actually do to help out a situation now? Absolutely. So I'm going to, I'm going to plug Hattie. I don't get anything for it, but I'm gonna play. he doesn't even know I exist, but his website is called visible learning. Uh, and so go visit that. Um, but so Hattie has been doing this a really long time. He's of a name like Bob Marzano, you know, these, these brilliant thinkers, these meta-analysis thinkers. Yep. So Hattie has a barometer of, uh, of influence. And uh, on, on the Hattie scale, 0.5 is a year's worth of growth for a student, okay? So then he takes all these strategies, all these methodologies, everything from co-teaching to block scheduling, uh, but also other strategies. One that you're interested in, which I know is classroom discussions. Yeah. Um, classroom discussions gets a 0.82 rating on the Hattie scale. So if 0.5 is one year's worth of growth, 0.82 is a year and you know almost a almost a, almost a year and a half yeah. worth of growth, um, and, and a little bit actually no my math is wrong over a year's worth of growth right I mean it's it's well over, um, so if we can get teachers and and classroom discussions don't change your structure you know if you're a period by period nine period a day high school uh, go into a block scheduling that's a challenge you may not want to take on during a pandemic or a pandemic recovery. 
Uh, so you may not do that. If you can afford co-teaching, great, but you may not be able to. Talking about just having classroom discussions, structuring those discussions so they draw on prior knowledge okay. so that you can create a model for thinking about new concept, uh, that is an easy win for schools to take on. Interesting. I, the and one I'm, that we were talking about last week, right? Yeah. That's a really interesting. That's a simple one. It's a socialized model, socialized example, but the, you can come up with examples of all of them once you start thinking yeah. this way. And, and it sounds like what you were referring to earlier about, you know, in the, in the rural areas, in the high poverty areas, the, the experiences, you know, with things like conversations and discussions and, and referencing knowledge and life events with new concepts, that's what is stagnating or just doesn't exist in certain places. And, and it's not fair to say that, that it, it's really only high poverty areas where that happens. I think that that could happen in a home anywhere where there isn't a lot of support, you know, for to, to talk about what uh, what you're going through, for lack of a better phrase, yeah. you know, and being able to, you know, talk those things through, have a voice in a conversation, have somebody listen to you, and then kind of make sense of the world with it. Yeah. So two, two really critical elements, right, in, in these classroom discussions is one, Hattie does not rate that according to any subgroup. So that is all students. It's 0.82 for everyone. High poverty, uh, affluence, race, all those you know, ethnicities and, and or, country of origin. None of those are, are precluded. He's doing global research meta-analysis. So 0.82 is the impact, pa impact factor for all students when 0.5 is one year's worth of growth. So it's huge. Second thing is, you're dealing with the social emotional component when you get into this. So, yeah. so kids were isolated for a long time. They were processing by themselves what they would have been processing with their peers and adults in their buildings. Kids were processing challenging concepts in their lives, experiences, things they were seeing, things they were hearing, without having anyone to soundboard. And so introducing these conversations in classrooms does a couple things. We spoke last week about uh, taking, you know, I, I actually saw a lesson done with this. This is not, I, I give credit to my teachers on it. Um, uh, Michelle Baldwin was a special education teacher and Eric Viner was the social studies teacher and they were doing a terrific job. Uh, kudos to both of them. They needed to discuss uh, the robber barons and the Gilded Age. So, how to get that when the kids had so much interrupted formal education in their previous year where they would get that foundational knowledge. Uh, they got to it by drawing basically correlations between the map that the kids, the social map of the school, where the students are at this part and the teachers are at this part, administration's here, superintendent's here in this hierarchical structure of power, right? They then compared that to the fuel system, which the kids had learned a little bit about in one of the closed years. Yeah. And then drew that parallel further to the Gilded Age. But they did it all through orchestrated discussion by taking what the kids were familiar with yeah. in their lives right. and then attaching images and concepts to it. You know, Piaget's schema theory in itself, right? Interesting. You know, and in a way, it's so intuitive. You know, as a teacher, you know you can't walk in there and just throw a concept up without referencing it, right. right? But this pandemic, you know, and all this trauma that, that kids are experiencing, let's just be honest, you know, this, this is something that, you know, when you talk about what you're referencing, it, for about a year and a half there, all we had to reference was an isolated environment where there was a lot of anxiety and stress. And then that kind of, I think, if I'm getting you, that's why we're talking social emotional learning now. You need to essentially, I don't want to say we need to become all become counselors because in a way that helps everyone. If you're a parent, if you're a teacher, if you're in tune, yeah, you know with some of the non-academic parts of, you yeah. know, a human being, you're going to be more effective. Yeah. So so I I think that that what you're saying is very intuitive as well.
It is. And, and I would, I would guard against, you know, pretending like we're all going to become counselors. There are counselors They're, They have a training set that, that I don't have, um, you know, as an administrator or as a, a former English teacher, but, but we can all become good listeners. There you and go. by listening, you, you know, we really open up the opportunity to, the nice thing about listening is when you listen well, you open up the opportunity to hear things uh, and people will, you know, the kids will, will tell you things that, that you need to know about them. Hey, um, you're, you know, you're preaching to the choir with that one. I, I, I really think, I mean, personally, I think if you get a good discussion, a good conversation going, I think that is fuel to, to, to have joy, a true joy in what you're doing as a professional. You know, when you feel like everyone is comfortable enough to be themselves, you know, and, and to, you know, listen and be heard. I mean, it's really elementary stuff, but, you know, at this point, we need it. Everyone needs it, yeah. right? Um, and I'd include the teachers, Fred. I mean, we didn't talk on this level, but I'm sure you have all kinds of things to say about w what some of their struggles are, you know, because these are the leaders in the classroom, but maybe that's another, another yeah. you know, conversation with you. Yeah, I mean, we, we saw national trends. Thankfully, the, the trends, the research that projected what we would see for teacher attrition were far, far off. They were really overshooting the mark. Teachers are much more resilient than, uh, than researchers thought they would be. Yeah. Um, but we did see a lot more days. I mean, to, in your personal districts, take account. How many, uh, how many days paid off, how many paid days off did people take? You know, how many sick days and these sorts of things. And if you saw that increase, my guess is it probably happened sort of at the beginning of this year and probably faded shortly after the, the winter break. Um, that's what our, our trend data showed. Yeah. But people were scared. People were, felt underprepared. Even your most expert teachers felt underprepared to take on the year. Um, and, you know, and also they're marrying this concept of their personal lives. I have children going through this. And now I'm going to usher your children through this. And that dichotomy, that dualism, you know, we cannot underestimate the challenges here. Uh, we saw, I think there's a lot of parallels between the, uh, teaching and nursing. Uh, nurses were on the front line. Um, and, and I think that, that the country, I hope the country takes a minute uh, at the end of this to really thank those, those especially those two branches uh, of human services because they were heroes. They, you know? they absolutely so, were. Yeah, they absolutely were, you know, and, and it's, uh, boy, we've been through a lot. I, um, <laughs> I, I've had a, con I just had a conversation with some, some uh, uh, principals and some teachers recently where one principal, I believe she was from New Jersey, middle school principal, um, she just just came out and said the kids are not okay. I, I, I I'm gonna say it. The kids are not okay. And she actually added in as well, Fred, kind of a different maybe angle on the technology side. The kids are so used to communicating asynchronously through text messages where you don't have to be there with people, partly because of the isolation of the pandemic, partly because that was a trend beforehand. It's already happened, right? But that those that's another kind of obstacle to getting the discussions going and getting, you know, people comfortable to see like facial expressions when you're talking to someone in a room. And you know, th th so there's a lot of layers to this. Yeah. Years ago there used to be a disability classification called nonverbal learning disorder. Uh, but but nonverbal learning disorder, it, I, don't, I don't think it's in the DSM-4 anymore, but it used to be that you would not, if you had that, you wouldn't understand facial expression. You wouldn't understand tonation of, uh, or intonation, intonation of voice. You'd miss these subtle social cues. Uh, everything was very much literal in your interpretation. I think that we have enough viable research between what we know about literacy, um, what we know about uh, prior knowledge, what we know about attaching schema, you know, in the Piaget format, what we know about responding to students with interrupted formal education, SIFE students, which are usually immigrant students. We'd like to preserve that language for them, but, but it's, there's strategies in there that work from the John Hattie work. The question is, 
or maybe the point, I guess, is that at some point we have to start putting these together. There is a roadmap to be found. Um, I like to think that I've contributed some of this uh, in small scale, but there is a roadmap that has to be found. And honestly, going back to accountability, the federal government cannot be requiring us to do 5% of our lowest performing schools. They should take that money, that energy, and that focus, and they should develop the map by which we can recover what we know is lost. I was going to ask, put it all together, and I think that you just did. We need a map. We're not in a perfect world. We have the components. We have the, the understandings already. We have the direction. We have the data. We just need a little bit of creativity, and we need to care about these kids now. Care about kids first. Yeah. Don't put traumatic pressure on schools and systems. It's going to trickle down. We're not going to address the real problem. No. And there's, there are good resources at the federal and the state level that I know from talking to some of our folks here in New York, New York State Department of Education, they would rather be doing that than figuring out how to count test scores. Well, uh, I, I know. that's great to know. That's great to know. I'd like to know who is the source or what is the source? I, I mean, is this, are we all the way up to, to politics? Yeah, yeah. You know, the federal fe federal Department of Education has got to make a decision in in the best interest of these children, uh, and they have to stop pretending that we're in an era of accountability. Accountability has a place, but it's not right here, right now. Maybe it will be in five years if we do this work to get us back on track. But if we don't, then it won't have a place in five. You heard it here first. An accountability expert says we need to chill <laughs> for at least a little bit, for at least yeah. a little bit, at least a little bit. Think creatively. This, Fred, this has been great, you know, and, and thank that. you so much for your time. I mean, is there anything else you wanted to add? Um, I wanted to wrap it up. I really, I really appreciate your perspective on this. And um, now that you're, you're giving really a, a problem from different perspectives, and we're all usually stuck in our own, and it's hard enough in our own. And I hope you didn't, you know, um, uh, make people lose faith that the problem is actually bigger than just our own, you know, situation. But we we can do it. We just gotta. Um, there's some quote out there, Fred. I don't know the quote. I don't know who said it, but I got the gist of it. And that's this: once you define what your problem is. You're 95% done in solving it. That's right. Yeah. I butchered somebody. I, I'm going to go back and get it, and I'll correct it maybe in the write-up of this. But really appreciate uh, the time, yeah. Fred, and let's it, do it, this again. It, I'd love to. If I can leave with one thing in honor of Teach Difference work, uh, I'll, leave with, leave, I'll lead you with, leave you with a quote. Uh, Thank it's you John so much. Kennedy. And I think it captures this era perfectly. And it is when written in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters. One represents danger and the other represents opportunity. I think that right now we're in crisis and it's time that we are turning the page from looking at the danger to looking at the opportunities. And that's the map that we're gonna find. Thanks man. Fred, thank you so much. All right, great. All right, take care.